today I have the great pleasure of speaking with an amazing person, great friend, um, the uh, Hall of Fame speaker from the National Speaker Association, uh, the guru of branding, and so on and so forth, Bruce Trakel. He's making many great points. Um, when he's talking about speaking, he said three things need to happen. It have to be entertaining, it have to be educational, and to be enlightening. And he will also uh, share with us different points that we can be applying in our own business so that we are connecting emotionally uh, with our audience before connecting with them intellectually uh, and how to make your scar your star. Enjoy listening. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. I am absolutely delighted today to speak with my friend Bruce Turkel. Bruce is, is everywhere. If you look at any um, a network TV, he's uh, an advisor for CNN. He's been on Fox also for many years, both at the same time, which is unique. He's been writing for all the big magazine, uh, been published in the New York Times, uh, Entrepreneur, everywhere, Forbes. Uh, he's been speaking at MIT, Harvard. He is uh, a national a Speaker Association Hall of Fame. Uh, he plays the harmonica. Uh, I, I mean, I can go on and telling you all the great achievement he's done. Uh, he's publishing books. Uh, the fifth one, all about them, uh, is a top 10 uh, Forbes business book. He's writing the next one that he's going to talk about today. Uh, and also, he founded with other amazing people an organization in Miami called the Strategic Forum that uh, I am very uh, honored and uh, very lucky to be a member. That's how we met. Bruce, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for the invitation, Eric. And I, I forgot with all the uh, instrument behind you to say that you were uh, an harmonica player, that uh, you created the band, that you're playing regularly. What else? <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, you know, only my, only my grandmother wants to hear all those things. I think that was plenty. That was a good place to start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's so many things I'd like to, to, to speak with you. And then when we were preparing this, uh, also so, some of the, uh, the element you mentioned, I'd like to start with something you said that good brand make people feel good, but great brands make people feel good about themselves. And, and I guess that's what the, uh, the content of uh, your last book, All About Them, right? Correct. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. The idea is quite simple. In the old days, and old days means pretty much before the internet, um, you had to tell people everything there was to know about you if you wanted to do business with them because they didn't really have any other way of learning about you. So you talked about yourself. I did this, then I did that. Kind of like that great introduction you just gave me if I had done it myself. But the truth is today, because of democratized information, because of onload, uh, online um, um, wikis and search, because of Google, because of iPhones and Siri and everything else, people have access to as much or as little information as they want at all times. So anybody you're going to do business with, anybody you're gonna deal with, have an interaction with, knows everything they wanna know about you. There's no need for you to blow your own horn. Instead, What's happening is there's so much out there now. There are so many choices. There are so many possibilities. There are so many different places we can go to get jobs done, to get purchases made, to, to really do whatever it is we need to do, that the best marketers are no longer talking about themselves. It's questionable, by the way, whether they ever did, but certainly now they're not. Mm -hmm. They're talking about their consumers. And so that's what that line comes from. A good brand makes you feel good. Hey, look what I got. Look what I just bought. Look how well it works. Look how well it does this or that. But the best brands make you feel good about yourself, help you to self-identify who you are, what you do, why you matter with what you buy, what you use, what you employ, and let's face it, who you vote for. Mm -hmm. All of those purchase decisions are the ways we tell the world but more importantly, we tell ourselves who we are. Absolutely. And, and I'm fascinated when uh, I speak with some of my colleagues in, in the meetings and even industry or people that I'm coaching, I'm telling them, people don't care about what you do. It's excuse me? No, they care about what you're going to do for them. Instead of saying, I've done this and I work for that. Okay, it's, by, it's part of, of the social proof 
and reassuring people. But why don't you ask them question about what is their concern? What is their strategy? What is their competition? What is keeping up, uh, keeping them up at night instead of trying to speak about yourself? My favorite story about going to events, I always meet the meeting planners, uh -huh. uh, the meeting professionals. I meet the event organizers, whoever they are. And I always say the same thing. When I first meet them, I say, I love meeting event organizers at the beginning of the event because at the beginning of the event, you're nervous. And at the end of the event, you're drunk. So you're always, and they always laugh because what it demonstrates is I understand that right now they're so worried. And then of course, once this is all over yeah. is when they can let their hair down. So for example, if I'm speaking out of town, if I'm attending an event out of town, the minute I land in the airport in that city, obviously not something I've done in a few months, but did before, yeah. hopefully we'll be doing again soon. First thing I do is where is it? I grab my phone and I take a selfie of myself with the name of the city that I'm in behind me, you know, welcome to Indianapolis or Portland or whatever it is. And then I send a text to the meeting organizer and I say, I'm in Indianapolis, don't worry. Or I just got to Vegas, go worry about something else. And then Precious. I get to the property, the hotel, the event, and I take another picture of myself, another selfie of myself with the sign, you know, the MGM Grand or welcome to the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And it says, I'm at the event. Go worry about something else. And then I go to check out the room. I'm in room B15 or I'm doing the keynote at the, at the, at the banquet hall, whatever it is. And I take a third picture and you'd say, oh my goodness, why don't you leave them alone? Because I want them to know yeah. I'm easy. I'm done. Yeah. Don't worry about me. You got other crap to worry about. I always go up to the AV guys. I introduce myself and I say to them, my job is to make your job easy. And awesome. They look at me like I'm insane. And I say, listen, I need a, a wireless lavalier. I would like this or that. Here's my music. Here's my opening. Here's my bio. Here's my intro rather. It's all right here. Here's whatever else I need. My job is to make your job easy because I know how difficult it is for them because of the people they have to deal with. Absolutely. And so I make them feel good about themselves, that they made the right decision in choosing me, but more importantly, that they're really good at their jobs. It's phenomenal because you, you're really putting yourself uh, in their shoes. I remember when I had my uh, corporate event company, I would check at every step, just like you said. <laughs> exactly. I remember a friend in, in Spain, she would tell me, Eric, how many years have we run project together? Why do you keep on checking? And I said, Corinne, the day I will not check, I will not be doing this business anymore. So to the point, actually made me think of a, another story that I, I quoted you regularly when people ask me how you become a professional speaker. And I love your answer on how to become a professional speaker. So not only we have meetings and event business owners, but obviously also business owners as speakers. So Bruce, how, do some, how does somebody become a professional speaker? I know there's two options. Well, you just put me on the spot. I hope I have the answer right. What I always tell people is if you want to speak more, speak more. Well, you tell a story about the two options, about one, and I quoted you all the time, said, Bruce always say, if you want to become a speaker, you have two options. The first one is you land a plane on the Hudson. Oh, oh, and oh, 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 yes. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. Yes. Number one, you have three options, actually. You land okay. a plane on the Hudson River and save 150 people. And then they say, because the next day, Sullenberg was the uh, most, most highly desired speaker in the United States. And rightly so, yeah. And they'll say, oh, my God, I can't do that. I'll go, okay, well, then be the president of the United States, because after he got out of office, Bill Clinton and then Barack Obama, Bush didn't want to do it. But those two guys were the highest paid speakers like that. And people say, oh, my God, I can't do that. I go, okay, then it takes 10 years of hard work. And speaking and speaking and speaking. Love it. That's right. If you want to speak more, speak more. One of the things that another point that you mentioned that I love said, people don't choose what you do. They choose who you are. So as a, as a yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to explain as a speaker, but we can also talk about it for event managers. Correct. Meeting professionals. Yeah. Um, but I'll use the speaker point of view. I say this to speakers all the time when they talk about how, well, I do this, I do that, I speak. I say, let me explain something to you. If you are a keynote speaker 
and you say, hi, I am Joe Blow, keynote speaker, what you're telling the world is I can fill 55 minutes with stuff. Mm. Hopefully good stuff because you're a professional, right? Mm. Well, so can every other keynote speaker and lots of them are good. And don't kid yourself to think you're the best in the world because you're not. There's lots of great speakers out there. Just like there's lots of great meeting professionals and there's lots of great event organizers and there's lots of great AV professionals and there's lots of great F and B professionals. And if you're one of those, you know you've worked with other ones who are really good. People don't choose what you do. What you do is cost of entry. If you're not a great speaker, if you can't fill 55 minutes with great stories and emotion and the highs and the lows and you don't know how to pace it and you don't know how to entertain and you don't know how to educate and you don't know how to enlighten your audience, guess what? You're not a speaker. <laughs> but just because you can do all those things doesn't mean you get the gig either. I mean, look, we all have a friend who plays guitar, who's amazing, right? Not me, by the way. I know you see the guitars. I'm not that good. But we all have a, a, a guitar player friend and we tell people, oh yeah, he's better than Eric Clapton. Oh yeah, she's better than mm. John Mayer. And they might be, but it doesn't matter if they're not out there doing it. You don't choose what, people don't choose what you do. They choose who you are. They decide who they want, running their meeting, selecting their speakers, picking the venues, doing the fam trips, doing the familiarity programming, setting all of that up. Of course you have to be able to do it, but it's not enough. People don't choose what you do, they choose who you are. Right, and also the fact that, uh, and, and I know you are always amazing and learning and, and inserting new stories, um, contrary to some other people who are telling the same story and okay, you've, you heard them once, uh, that's it. I've heard you speak, I don't know how many times, and it's never twice the same. Uh, you might use one or two of uh, the same story, but uh, it's always new material and, and to the point. Uh, so that's also part of who you are, is always learning, right? One of my pet peeves are speakers who say to me, you know, it's easier to find a new audience than write a new speech. I don't agree with that at all. The whole point of a talk is to do three things, to be entertaining, to be educational, and to be enlightening. Mm. Ultimately, The point of a talk is that the audience should leave the room transformed. They should come in thinking, feeling one way, and they should leave thinking or feeling something different. And more importantly, they should be aware of that transformation because mm -hmm. that's when, forget the speaker, that's when they say to the person who invited them, the organization, the association manager, uh, the CEO of the company, the regional director, whoever it is, that's when they say, wow, that was valuable because they understand that the experience changed them. Otherwise, heck, just send the, uh, the link to the YouTube video and nobody has to go anywhere. But exactly. if they go to an event and they emerge different than mm -hmm. they walked in, they feel a real sense of value. Well, you can't do that if you tell the same story over and over and over, not because it wasn't a great story, but because of relevance. One of the little tricks that I love, and anybody, any speakers who, who watch this, Eric, they should steal this idea and use it, and it's okay with me. You get to the hotel, and there's always free newspapers, at least the events I do, the upscale events, upscale hotels. You know, there's always a New York Times, a Wall Street Journal, a USA Today, and a local paper. And I'm a real... And as always, a butler say, welcome back, Mr. Turkel. <laughs> yes, there is. Thank you so much for being a platinum member. We appreciate it. Which basically means, thank you for staying in hotels instead of being with your family, right? right. Um, and, oh, and because you're so great, here's a free bottle of water. We hope you appreciate it. Um, and you get the newspaper. And I'm a real newspaper fanatic because I want to know what's going on all the time. And I read through them all. And in every paper, I can find a story, an ad, an editorial, something in the headlines that relates exactly to what I want to talk about. Then when I walk up on stage, I have that newspaper under my arm. I usually put a yellow sticky in it or I folded it. So I lay it on top of the lectern and then somewhere during my talk, I'll reach for the paper and I'll say, now I don't want you to just think this is theory because in today's New York Times or today's USA Today, which you can get in the lobby and I'll pick it up. Right. You get to do that big dramatic pop, right? It says right here, and then I'll read the headline and I'll show it to them. What does this have to do with your business? Mm. Because it's one thing to have seen it in the newspaper. It's one thing to have heard the speaker talk about it. But if I tell you what it has to do with your business, and then you go, oh, I could work with that. 
boom, you were transformed. You have been entertained, the popping of the paper. You've been educated with the information, but more importantly, it's the last of the three E's of a successful, a successful speech or talk. You've been enlightened. That's when the little light bulb goes off. Because let's face it, if the speaker's entertaining, that's great, but that could be a juggler or a dancing, dancing uh, dog act or whatever, right. terrific. But who cares? An hour later, you go, wow, that guy was great, but so what? If the speaker is educational but not entertaining, well, you don't have to watch the presentation. Like I said, you could just have the link to the YouTube or you could just mail me the white paper and I'll just read it. Right. But if the speaker is both of those things and also enlightening, that means a week later, when Eric is sitting in his office and he's taking a phone call and he has a problem, and then he thinks, wait, the speaker that my association brought in told me I should always do blah, 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 mm. boom, enlightenment. And right. that's where the value is. And that's that transformation. And that's when that person says, you know what? I'm going to pay my dues next year. I'm going to re-up. I'm going to bring in three more people from my organization. I'm going to order those videos so I can show them, share them with my team. That's where the event organizer, the meeting planner, the professional, that's where they really show the value of what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I nailed it, totally. Uh, now, I, you, I need you to enlighten me because, you know, sometimes when I pronounce words, people understand something else. Uh, and no, we don't have the subtitles uh, for, for uh, our conversation, for my side of the conversation, but you said something and I'm still wondering exactly what does that mean? That function is cost of entry. Well, you said that beautifully. And by the way, let me just say that anybody who makes fun of your accent, besides the fact that it's charming and disarming, and uh, I have to assume very sexy, you also speak four languages, so at least that I know of. <laughs> I you. speak one and I, saw, I try very hard to speak two, so you'll never hear me make fun of, of an accent like that. Um, function is cost of entry. So critical to keep in mind. It's what we talked about earlier when we said that people don't buy what you do, they buy who you are. Think about automobiles. Automobiles get you from point A to point B. That's what they do, that's their function. Right. And it used to be that Volvos and Mercedes Benzes were better automobiles. They got you there, they were more reliable, they were safer, they lasted longer, they were more right. durable. But that's no longer true. Today, all automobiles are computer designed, use computer generated components, computer management systems. They all get you from point A to point B. You can't argue that a Mercedes gets you there any better than a Kia or a Hyundai or a Toyota or a Jeep. They might get you there classier or they might get you there more elegantly, but they don't get you there any better. Function has become cost of entry. In the world we live in today, there's just too many programs, products, processes that make sure that everything works. If you don't have function, guess what? You're not in the game. But right. just because you do have function doesn't mean you're in the game either. Think about it. Function is table stakes. It's anteing up. If you go to Vegas and you walk into the, into the poker hall, the poker parlor, and you sit down, the first thing you have to do before they give you cards is ante up, right? You have to take your chips and you have to put them in the pot in the middle. Now, that doesn't mean you'll win. That just means you have to pay to play. Well, function is paying to play. If you are an event manager, then you have to know the business. If right. you are a meeting planner, then you have to understand what it is that your attendees <coughs> want. Me. Who wants to know, bless you, who wants to know smoking room? Who needs to be near the pool? Who needs to be near the gym? Who wants the room on the high floor, right? You need to know all of that stuff. But just because you do, doesn't mean you'll be successful. Uh, function is cost of entry. You do that in order to demonstrate how good you are how valuable you are, and most importantly, how valuable you make your customers, clients, and employers mm -hmm. feel, not about you, remember, not about, but about, about themselves. Them. Now, I understand now, and then uh, I always say to, to meeting and even planners, the logistical part, in your example, is the cost of entry. Right, right. It is, it is an assumption that everything's going to go well. Now, where the branding and the differentiation and the positioning comes is in the question that they ask their customer before and that are more strategic question instead of how many people are coming, how many rooms you need, 
more into why are you doing this? What are you trying to achieve? What you expect the people to remember and act upon after the meeting? Is that the same parallel? It's exactly the same. And let me give you one question. You don't even have to ask all those questions. If you simply say to your host, to your client, to the person who wants you to put on the event, let me ask you a question. When this event is over, a day afterwards, a week afterwards, a month afterwards, you pick the time. But when this event is over, how do you want your attendees to feel? Mm. And they'll think for a minute, what do you mean? I want them to be happy they had a good time. Well, of course you do. That's like saying I want them to be happy they enjoyed the meal or happy they enjoyed the venue. Right. But what do you want them to feel? What do you want them to think? Oh, I want them to think that our association brings them great ideas that they never find on their own. Or, oh, I want them to think that the people they met in the networking events could be their most valuable cho uh, choice uh, chance rather for opportunities in the future. Mm. Oh, I want them to think that our workshops show them how to earn extra money with the licensing and the CLEs we provide. Everybody's going to have a different answer. Right. But if you as the organizer, the manager, the planner, know what that answer is, your job is done because, or your job is easy because knowing how many people are coming, come on, that's a checklist. Mm -hmm. Knowing exactly. yep. what languages you need on the headphones, that's a checklist. Knowing how many vegetarian meals you need, that's the cost of entry function part. You yep. got to do it, but you're not getting rehired because you did do it. By the way, you won't get hired if you don't. No, do exactly. Oh, you're not going to get rehired. You know, when I grew up in the restaurant business, I don't know that you know this, Eric, but no. my parents were in the restaurant business and I worked in a lot of restaurants. And I really learned everything I needed to know about customer service from working in both fast food restaurants, QSR, and also the fancy restaurants. And you know, the restaurant business basically breaks down into two parts. You have front of the house and back of the house. It's pretty obvious what's what. Front of the house is where the customer sits. It's the maitre d'. Right. It's the waiters, the bartenders. Back of the house, it depends if the kitchen is exposed or not, but back of the house is dishwashing, uh, accounting, bill paying, all those kind of things. Nobody goes to a restaurant because of back of the house. They go because of front of the house. The food they see, the atmosphere they enjoy, yeah. the way the maitre d' treated them, all of that, right? But people will not ever go back again because of back of the house. So if the food comes out and there's lipstick on the plate, you're never going back again. Mm. If, you're, if you're eating your food and there's a hair in the food, you're never going back again. That's mm. back of the house. However, you've never heard someone say, oh my God, I love that restaurant. They have the cleanest plates I've ever seen. <laughs> there's no lipstick on the plate. Yeah. That's right. I love that restaurant because there's no lipstick on my coffee cup, right? Look, look, it's completely white. I love that. No one ever goes because of back of the house, but you don't return because of back of the house. Right. Well, same thing with what we're talking about. Yeah. You get the job because of your front of the house skills, which is your customer service, your ability to make people feel good. You keep the job because of all that other stuff that you have to mm. do. That's the cost of entry part. No clean plates. The restaurant is dead. Clean plates. It may or may not be successful. And, and I love your question about um, how you make them feel. Uh, it's one of the questions I always ask afterwards. And, and that's a great segue to uh, the, the uh, emotion and the relationship you're building. You always say that you must take an, an emotional connection before you make an intellectual connection, which is right. Now, as a speaker, you get into a room, there's 1,000 people in there. How do you make this emotional connection with people? How you prepare yourself? Do you come earlier on, attend different sessions at the conference, speak with people? How do you do that before delivering the message? There's lots of ways to do it. I do all those things you talked about, except I do it um, sub rosa. I don't walk around saying, hi, I'm your keynote speaker. I know a lot of speakers do. They want to build up a cadre of friends before they ever get up on stage. What I would rather do is get the inside baseball on the business. I want to hear what's going on. I want to hear the names that come up a lot. So I just chat with people. Hey, tell me, tell me what you're doing here. Tell me what you think of this event. Tell me what you think of this association. Who have you been involved with? What did you like? What didn't you like? And I'm always taking notes. And you know, I'm always scribbling pictures. So I'm yeah. always 
the doodles of the people and what they talked about. So then when I get up on stage, I can say, you know, last night I went to your cocktail party. Yeah, I know you didn't know I was the speaker, but I was at the cocktail party and I was speaking with Bill. Bill, where are you? Hand goes up. And you know what Bill told me? No, don't worry, Bill. I'm not going to tell them that part. Everybody <laughs>, laughs, even though, of course, I just made that up. Love it. Bill told me that your industry has a particular issue. And then I was talking to Phoebe. And guess what? Phoebe told me the same thing. And then a few minutes later, I spoke to Consuelo and she told me something very similar. Well, my grandfather used to have a saying, and I know, Eric, your grandfather had the same saying. If three people tell you you're drunk, lay down. If three people tell you something, maybe you should pay attention. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that, shall we? Now, what just happened? Everyone who knows Bill thinks, oh my God, you know him. Everyone who knows Consuelo, everyone knows Phoebe feels that way. Everyone else thinks, wow, this person took the time to get to know us because oh. they are a group. But more awesome. importantly, I'm not talking about myself. I'm going to be talking about them. I tell a story about a hotel room and a cockroach in the hotel room and what happened and all that. And everybody laughs. And I'll say, okay, you're all laughing, right? And they'll laugh. I go, because it's funny. Yes. You know, I, gave, I told this story a couple of weeks ago at the American Association of Hotel and Motel Owners. Guess what? Nope. They didn't laugh so much. Let me tell nope. you why this story affects your business too. And then everybody goes from laughing to, oh. And then, you know, the old, uh, if you remember the movie Poltergeist, the little yep. girl watching TV. And yeah. The static, it's going, and then the parents walk in and the girl turns around and says, they're here. I say, so it's the same thing. I told you this story about hotels and about cars and you don't care because you're not in those businesses or it doesn't worry you. Let me tell you why you need to worry. Because again, a good talk is like a good opera or a good musical. It's not just all good, 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 fun, 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 but it's taking people up and down, emotional highs, emotional lows, making them feel something. Because when they do that, that's when they really pay attention. And that's when they get the sense wow, this speaker knows my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's what you said. You have to make that emotional connection. I could say to them that I know in your industry you have 17,942 framets per square inch, whatever, and recite jargon. Or I could say, listen, I've spoken to a couple of different people and I've done some research and I went on all your websites. Don't worry, I'm not going to pick on any of you individually, but let me show you what I learned. And let me show you why what you've been doing, what got you here, won't get you there. Yep. That's when everybody's antenna perks up because you're talking about them and you're not talking at them, but you're talking to them right here. Yeah. And, and, and you're making a very good point, which also um, th there's more behind it. It doesn't happen like that. It means that you're taking a lot of time preparing that, a lot of time researching and preparing your talk. And that's not, that's not what a lot of people do. They just take it for granted. Uh, okay, they, they, they pull up something that they've been doing. And I'm not only talking about speakers. I'm, I'm talking uh, people that uh, are in industry and uh, kind of copy-paste the same type of uh, uh, How many events do you go to where the hors d'oeuvres are in martini glasses? Mm. Okay, one time it was cute. Two times it was, oh, yeah, that's nice. And then three times it's, oh, I guess they just checked off the martini, right? Instead of yeah. thinking... Where am I? What am I doing? What am I offering my audience? How can I do something special? I tell uh, speakers, new speakers all the time, always remember, sponta spontaneity takes a lot of preparation. Yes. The idea is to hop up on stage like you've, you're just, bam, here it is, just coming right off the top of my head. Like, that's the trick. You know, the reason that stand-up comedians are so funny. That's amazing. Tell a joke, and you think, Oh my God, he's never told that joke before. But yeah. the guy told it yesterday in Duluth and the day before in Wisconsin and the day before that in Wyoming. And, yeah. But it's that sense of freshness that we're experiencing this together. And that research, all that work, all that reading, all that learning. You remember the movie, another great movie, um, Short Circuit with Steve Gutenberg. There was that little robot. His name was Johnny Five. And nope. Johnny Five would take books and just go... Brrr, input, input, and he would just read all these books. He was going to become, understand everything about human civilization. Well, obviously, we're not going to do that, but that's how I look at a new event, is I want to learn everything I can learn about the organization. I can't go in there 
for the American Association of Galvanized Pipe Manufacturers and manufacture galvanized pipe. But I can understand why it's used, when it's used, where it's used, and more importantly, yeah. why it's not used. I'm not going to be an HVAC guy, or I'm not going to, if I'm speaking at Sherm, I'm not going to necessarily be an HR uh, uh, professional, but right. I can understand. I was an employer. I had a lot of employees when I ran my business. I yep. can understand what these people are dealing with day in and day out. And then I can go talk to them about, let me give you some tips, some inside tips, have some tips, some tools, some techniques on how to make your life better. Let me teach you what I learned working with clients like Bacardi and Discovery Channel and HBO and Miami Tourism. Let me tell you what the big boys do and the big girls do that yeah. you can use to make your business and more importantly, your life better. And Nike and uh, Remax and ISG. <laughs> See, I, yeah. I, I, I did my preparation. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. And it always is so much better coming out of your mouth than mine, isn't it? <laughs> That's true. Then another thing that you said that I really like, and, and if you can elaborate on it and, and also try to do the parallel for any business owner, especially going through the, this time this year, you said, make your scar your star. I talk How do you apply that? that? I talk about that most of the time when I'm up on stage. And if we have Q&A, and I'll explain the whole concept and what it means, and it means that your liabilities can become your assets. Often, what it is you think is your liability is your most endearing quality or your businesses. Um, for example, uh, post-it notes, they invented something that didn't stick. And then someone figured out how to make that into a hugely successful product. Or mm. Kentucky Fried Chicken had greasy chicken. So what did they do? They talked about it's finger licking good and mm. turned the negative into the positive. So people will say to me in the Q and A, yeah, I get that with those examples. And I have lots more examples, of course, but, um, how does that apply to me? Exactly. How does that apply to me? And I'll say, well, let me, you know, the old days, we don't really do this anymore, but the old days you'd give a talk somewhere, there'd be a yellow piece of paper on the chair. And that was the speaker evaluation. I said, now, of course it's done on phones, but mm. and it would say, um, you know, from a scale of one to 10, did the speaker understand <laughs> the subject? from one to 10, was the subject interesting and relevant and blah, 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 right? We've all seen those. And then there's that box that most of you won't fill out, which says, do you have anything else to say? But those of you who do, for me, you're gonna write, the speaker was so enthusiastic and energetic. And the reason I know that is because I've seen those over years and years. And let's face it, that's who I am. Now, I don't stand in the green room before I go on and go, okay, Bruce, remember, let's be energetic, let's be, it's just who I am. <laughs> yes, right? It's part true. of what, what I bring to the audience. Yeah. Okay. I said, but when I was in fifth grade, they had something very similar to a speaker evaluation. It was called a report card. Mm. It said on a scale of A to F, how well did the student, not the speaker, how well did the student know the material? Mm. On a scale of A to F, how well did the student prepare for and blah, blah, blah. Right? Same thing. Right. And then it said, write some notes of it. And my notes always said, Bruce is such a good student and he's a joy to have in class. If he could only stop drawing pictures, talking, <laughs> humming to himself, tapping on the deck, right? Yeah. I was enthusiastic and energetic then. It was probably called ADD or ADHD. We just yeah, I joined the club. Yep. Right? We just didn't have that diagnosis at the time. Yep. When I was in fifth grade and you're supposed to sit up right straight, that wasn't a good thing. Patty nope. McCall, who sat next to me, she was the student everybody wanted because she was brilliant and she sat up straight and smiled. I was always fidgeting and drawing and doing things. But now when I'm up on stage, you see that as an advantage. That's how I made my scar, mm. my star. And that's the sound that the people make when I tell them that story. Oh, and they see, and then they start thinking, where have I had these problems? Or whereas my business had these problems. Yeah. There's a, in the Keys, there's a little island called No Name Key. Mm. And on the way, and it's really out of the way. You have to go down to mile marker 30. You turn on Big Pine Key. You go on all these winding roads. And then oh, you've you come, never been there before. I can tell. Yeah. You come to a little place called the No Name Pub. And the sign says, a charming little place if you can find it. Nice. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. That yeah. They take the fact that it's hard to get to and hard to find, 
and they turn that into an advantage. Wow, it's exclusive. It's special. Hey, Eric, you and I, we got something going on. We have this little secret because we found it. You know what? You, you remind me of an amazing story. Uh, I, I had a client, Theo van Belleghem, amazing, amazing person. Uh, and he was working uh, for Schweppes. And we were doing the, the launch of uh, Schweppes Agrum uh, in, in um, Spain. We were in the south of Spain by Sevilla. And at the end of the, the three days program, we had this wonderful afternoon in a, an hacienda with a Venenciador, we're serving the Porto music, opera. It was phenomenal. And I'm calling the airline um, at noon just to make sure that they'll be on time. Oh, and I thought said, so you could stay another day. Right, and exactly. And they said, Eric, sorry, we got a delay. Uh, because, of course, the plane goes from one place to the other and then to the other and then come and pick us. And so 180 people over there at Sunday. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, everything went so well until now. What are we going to do? So I go to Theo and say, Theo, we have a problem. Uh, the plane is going to be late two hours. Um, what can we do? And we discuss. And immediately he said, I got this. He goes back, takes the mic. He said, ladies and gentlemen, are you enjoying yourself? Yay. Do you enjoy the sun? Yay. Do you know it's raining in Brussels? Oh, I managed to delay the plane for two hours and everybody went clapping. <laughs> That's great. I'm stealing that story, buddy. I'll give, you know, the speaker's rule. The first time I'll say, my friend Eric Rosenberg told me this story. The okay. second time I'm going to say, my buddy Eric. The third time I'm going to say, I heard a story. And the fourth <laughs> time, it's mine. I'm but I, 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 keep, I keep quoting you on the how to become a speaker. So you okay. can keep quoting I'll, me on this one. Then I will quote you. That's, that's a perfect example. He made the scar the star. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Thank you. I thought you were going to say, how would you like to stay two more hours? And they would all cheer. But he was even better. He said, I managed yeah. to delay our flight. And people clap. It was just, I, I never forget. That was phenomenal. And, and of course, him and me had the blast afterwards. That's for sure. That's now, a to, to end our conversation, I have one question to you. For you, sorry. Is that all there is? It's a Peggy Lee song. <laughs> okay, and it's the name of your next book. It, is that all there is, is the title of my next book. The concept is people who have reached a relative level of success and then reach a, hit a chasm in their lives. Um, I have found that most of these chasms, by the way, start with the letter D. Disease, debt downsizing, death, uh, dissatisfaction. Something happens and you have to shift. Now we've all had to shift because of Corona. Mm -hmm. We've all had to shift because of the political situations. There's been a number, especially in the meeting business. I mean, mm -hmm. March 15th, I was set up to have the best year ever of speaking and now let's face it. I, know. I have no speaking except for a few virtual events. Um, we've all had to shift. It's the zeitgeist of who we are in Western successful society. And the idea is that we've reached a relative level of success and now we need to change. So I interviewed people. I thought I would be interviewing people in their 70s and 80s who had shifted and then could tell the story of what happened and why they did what they did. But as I did my research, what I found out was this happens to people in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s. Mm -hmm. So I have spoken to, I think, 28 or so different people. Wow. People who have changed for lots of reasons. One guy sold a business at 36 and pocketed $60 million. It's a good problem to have. As a friend of yeah. mine says, that's a luxurious problem. But he still had to change his life. Another woman uh, got a job working for Buckminster Fuller, doing it in an academic position. And when she came home that night, her husband said, I'm leaving. I found another woman and I'm leaving and left her with two little girls. And now this job that was her dream job, but didn't pay enough money to support her family. And what did she do? How did she shift her life in order to accommodate what was going on? So you have people at the heights and you have people at the depths and everyone in between and what they did to change their lives. More importantly, what you, the reader, can do when you want to change yours. How can you learn from these people, take their best practices and figure out what it is you want to do? Awesome. And then when, when is it going to be published? Well, I don't know. I haven't gotten the final publication date yet. Okay. I will let you know. And I, if you'll invite me back, I'll come back and tell everybody about it. And I will uh, offer them some kind of great deal to get the book. 
Definitely. Thank you. And, and uh, in closing, uh, I know you have uh, for today, uh, become, you, 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 because you're the, uh, the uh, specialist of branding and uh, we all know how uh, it's important uh, to be branded, to be well positioned. I know you have uh, a gift for uh, those who are listening. I do. I always think it's critical to leave people with something. Remember, I want to create transformation. I want to be educational. I want to be in light, uh, um, entertaining, but I want to be enlightening. So anybody who's interested, um, just send me a note and I will give you for free. There's no other program or anything else. Um, the audio book to my previous book, which is called Building Brand Value. And it's all about the seven steps you need to build a brand. It could be a business brand, it could be a nonprofit brand, or it could be your personal brand, either in the right. industry or within the company you're working at. But there are seven things that I learned from these great companies that I worked with about how you build a brand. My website is just my name, BruceTurkel.com. And you can click on the contact me button. Just send me a note, say, hey, I heard John Eric's podcast and I'd love a copy of the book. By the way, there's no uh, automatic follow-up. There's none of that. You'll get a note back either from me or Scott, my assistant. We'll give you the link to the book, put you on the blog list where I write about this stuff every week and we'll stay in touch. But it's personal, it's us, and it's free. Awesome. So it's BruceTurkel.com. That's right. B-R-U-C-E-T-U-R-K-E-L.com. Awesome. Bruce, thank you so much. It's been thank a you. pleasure talking to you as usual. And uh, I can't wait to see you face to face, hopefully anytime soon. I hope that happens soon. You're a great interviewer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with an amazing person, great friend, um, the uh, Hall of Fame speaker from the National Speaker Association, uh, the guru of branding, and so on and so forth, Bruce Turkel is making many great points. Um, when he's talking about speaking, he said three things need to happen. You have to be entertaining, you have to be educational, and to be enlightening. And he will also uh, share with us different points that we can be applying in our own business so that we are connecting emotionally uh, with our audience before connecting with them intellectually uh, and how to make your scar your star. Enjoy listening.